nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi alkareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajmain we're going to talk about our superhero of today we've been talking about prophet ibrahim the last two times this is our second week into prophet ibrahim uh, just to recap for those who may not have remembered what we talked about prophet ibrahim our superhero of today has been the stalwart has been the 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 originator of three big religions of the world islam is one of them we know that but it also includes the religion of jewish uh, and uh, christian origins so we have a very very strong hero a very very strong individual who is actually bearing as a role model for a lot of communities uh, prophet ibrahim has been uh, in a couple of interactions already as you recall he had a uh, direct uh, audience with the king the king was called nimrod or namrud and uh, beat the king hands down in arguments and in logic and in reasoning all the things that a young person who knows what they're talking about can do uh, inshallah all of you are familiar with that idea what is really interesting here is that uh, many times people don't realize that uh, actually young people have an amazing ability to uh, get their points across they they can really get things across which sometimes old all the people cannot do because first of all they are more if you like open to new ideas and second i think the other very important part is they generally tend to see things in a more relaxed atmosphere they tend to see things in a little bit if you like bigger perspective etc especially because they mix with more young people in schools for example or other places so this uh, idea of the uh, prophet ibrahim alaihi salam coming and telling the king exactly where he belonged was something people were just completely unfamiliar with so ibrahim alaihi salam as you know had to leave and he now finds himself in a very isolated situation so he actually emigrates and as i was mentioning before this emigration is to an amazing place which means he is by this time communicating with allah god and he's getting directions from god you cannot fight this big battle against the people who are opposing you against a king that supposed to you against an atmosphere that does not allow you to portray what you know to be the truth it, it's not possible that you do it on your own so prophet ibrahim has the backing of god allah remember ibrahim alayhi salam has been told by god unbeknown to his wife and to his child he has a newborn child now this newborn child is called ismail he is a few months old in fact there is difference of opinion some people say that he is actually days old so but he is very young all the same and so he is young and his mother is young of course and ibrahim alay salam and this young family ibrahim alay salam is obviously much older but they travel into the desert to a place that is unknown to human beings it's completely de deserted we are talking about a place that is called makkah now but at that time there was no makkah it was a completely deserted place completely deserted place so what happens we now have a situation where ibrahim alay salam finds himself having to take his family to a deserted place and doesn't finish there he can't tell them why they are going there so they arrive and ibrahim alay salam is accompanying his wife and his child and when they arrive here they have this lonely desert absolutely lonely there's nothing there now the amazing part starts ibrahim alay salam cannot communicate to his wife the son is too young anyway to to his wife why are they there so there is this issue of why are they there and what should they do and ibrahim alay salam simply drops them there <laughs> and this is the part that you all have to understand because it takes a little bit of understanding before you realize subhanallah yeah, subhanallah sir. how can somebody who has this great mission not tell that but this is really what i want all of us to absorb today inshallah that when we are doing the right thing when we are doing the right thing and so, i don't mean the right thing because we think it's the right thing 
I mean it's the right thing because Allah has told us it's the right thing. Then, and I'll give you one example. We don't have to explain why we do salah. We don't have to explain. We simply have to explain we do salah because God told us to. Yes, we do need to talk about the concept of who Allah is. We do need to tell our children for those parents who are listening. We do need to understand who Allah is. We do need to understand what he has done for his creation and why he wants us to do what he does. But what we don't question is we don't question this on a regular basis. We develop a concept. We develop an understanding and we develop an understanding by having many conversations. This is not a one conversation. This can happen many times. This can happen several times. This can happen in different contexts. Who created the sun? Who created the moon? Who created your this earth? Who is responsible for the beautiful flowers? Who created the birds? Who created the fish? Who created this lovely pet that you have? Who created your mom and dad? You can have so many conversations. You don't have to restrict yourself to a specific situation where a child finds himself at the end of a receiving thing to say, well, I'm telling you that's why. No, that's not the reasoning. For those parents who are listening, this is not the reasoning we use with our children. We use very genteel, very soft, very logical reasoning. You'd be amazed to hear those of us who are young here, children particularly, how much they actually can look and understand the body language of their parents. They can see a lot more than sometimes we appreciate. And when we don't realize that, we will sometimes force things on them. Here, Ismail is of course too young. He doesn't, he won't understand anything anyway, even if somebody told him, but his mother, his mother asks Ibrahim alayhi salam, because what does Ibrahim alayhi salam do? Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, the prophet of God, has actually given them these two things. This is basically a water bottle, if you like, and some dates. That's it. That's all he has given them. And he's about to leave his infant son and his wife in the desert, in a place where there is nobody. There is just nobody. I want all of you to absorb that information for a minute or so to say, think about what it must have felt like. But now this is where the test comes. And what's the test? The test is, do you actually trust God? Do you actually trust Allah? Do you understand that Allah will never ask you to do something that actually does not have benefit for you? It may not be obvious to you. It may not necessarily be something you even agree with. But the fact is, if we understand who Allah is, and it's vital that we talk about Allah, it's vital that we have many conversations about God on all kinds of things. And this is where, as I've mentioned to all of you at the beginning, and I mention it again, the, the reason these stories, these prophet stories are so powerful is not just because of the morals that come out of them, the things that we learn, the things that may not be taught by cartoons, the things that may not be taught by movies. These, first of all, are powerful communication tools for us with our children, for children, for the, the parents. Remember Yusuf alayhi salam, those of you who watched Yusuf alayhi salam story, Yusuf had the ability to speak to his dad about a weird within inverted commas dream. It was a weird dream. It's going into another story, but my point is, how could you talk to your dad if you didn't have a good communication channel established? Yusuf was by most accounts thought to be a teenager, if that, he was not even a teenager, he was probably a tween. So imagine now somebody who is that young is able to say to his dad something that's so strange, 10 stars and a sun and a moon. My point is when you talk to your children regularly, when that established communication exists, it's not just the children now. In this case, Ibrahim alayhi salam's case, it's actually the wife. And I can say safely, that this is a family unit that's going to now do what you will about to see. What you're seeing, uh, sisters and brothers, is an amazing tale of what I would say trust. And I'm going to go into the lessons at the end, inshallah. It's literally unfolding in front of yourself. How in the middle of the desert, a father and a mother and a young boy are literally establishing history. And you will see in a minute what has come out of this amazing event. So. What has happened is Ibrahim alayhi salam is walking away. He has left his son and his, and his wife and his in the desert. And they ask, well, not they, but Hajra alayhi salam, peace be on her, 
asks her husband, what are you doing? Meaning she just doesn't get it. She asks it three times. It's only when Ibrahim does not answer, alayhi salam, when he doesn't answer, that she starts to understand this is something a bit more deep. What does she say next? She doesn't say, are you upset with me? She doesn't say that you arranged something for us that somebody will take care of us. She doesn't. She asks one question only. Did Allah order you to do this? This is her question after she realized Ibrahim is not going to tell her anything, but she wants to know this because confidence measures are still essential. So he says, yes, now, now her confidence level goes amazingly 200%. He says, if that's the case, then I know that Allah will not waste us. Allah will not let us go to waste. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to mention that these events that are unfolding in front of you are actually the basis of the fifth pillar of Islam called Hajj. And I'll tell you in a few minutes why that is. First of all, this place which is abandoned and in the middle of the desert, there's nothing there. Right now, there's a very thriving, very, very uh, populated city there called Mecca. This is what's happening right now. This is a place where every year millions of hujjaj, I mean, last year was an exception because of the COVID, etc. But every year, millions of people, millions of people, three to four, descend on this city from all over the world. What is Bring the reason? Me this is really what has happened. Now look at the picture in front of you. Uh, these are not Safa and Marwa hills. I've just put two hills for you to understand the background. This is where the, uh, the infant son and the daughter uh, and the mother are. So Ibrahim has left. That small water bottle water has finished and the dates have finished as well. Now Ismail, that infant kid, is crying because he's hungry. He's got no food. And Hajra hasn't got any water, alayhi salam, to give him. So she starts to look to see, are there any caravans passing? Because it's a desert. Sometimes there are caravans passing. So she's looking. And she's looking, not obviously at her height, but she's got these two mountains called Safa and Marwa. And she's basically running back and forward, back and forward, to try and see if she can see some activity which will help her understand is there something that will help her in this situation? Now, as she runs back and forward, back and forward, she actually sees something very interesting happening. What does she see? She sees that there is, in fact, a kind of activity just where Ibrahim's son and her son, Ismail, is rubbing his feet. He's crying. And so she's running back and forward between Safa and Marwa, the two mountain hills, to, to, to the top and to the bottom. Imagine how stressful that must be for a young woman who's obviously thirsty, just like the child is, who's hungry, just like the child is, but she's also a mother. And Allah wants to show us all, my brothers and sisters, Islam forever, that it's a mother running between two hills that's going to be memorized forever in this beautiful uh, legacy of Hajj, the fifth pillar of Islam. Why? Because every Haji, every Haji that goes there has to go between these two mountains to complete the Sa'i or the, uh, the component that involves running between these two hills. So it's really, they are mimicking that running of a mother thousands of years ago. So let everybody see how powerful that legacy is. Now, where Ismail is lying, this is where he is actually rubbing his, literally, as you can, I'm sure you, all of you have seen crying babies, but they kind of toss around. They're hitting their arms. They're maybe hitting their feet, but they're really hungry. And he's obviously agitated and hungry. But Hajira, his mother, notices that there is a small amount of water bubbling from where they have been, and where he's been lying. And this, my sisters and brothers in Islam, is the basis of the famous well called Zam Zam. Actually, the story goes that the chief angel, Jibrail actually hit the ground with the tip of his wing. Jibrail guys, all of you know, is the chief angel. And Allah had sent this to uh, the ground to help. Because remember, she's, she's making dua, right? I hope all of you make dua when things are, inshallah, you make dua anyway. 
We don't make dua only when things are not going well. We don't just raise our hands when things are not going well. We raise our hands anyway. You know what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said? He said, Allah loves those who ask him when things are going well, right? Allah loves them. And guess what? When you are used to asking, guess who knows you? All the angels that carry your duas up to Allah, they know you already. Don't wait for things to go wrong. Don't wait for things to go bad. Don't wait for your uh, stress to go red. <laughs> you and me should be making dua regularly, right? I mean, Hajra's situation, the mother of Ismail is a special situation. There's no question about it. My point here is the angel appeared in response to Hajra alayhi salam's running. And of course, Allah wants to not obviously, Allah Ta'ala has not put them in this test to harm the baby or to harm her. Allah is simply testing, are you up to the test? The test is, can you trust Allah despite everything? Now, think about it. Deserted place, middle of the desert, no human being around, no physical means. You haven't got something to dig the ground with. Even if you did, how do you know water is even there? How do you know where water is? I don't know if you, I'm sure all of you have heard. When, dug, when wells are dug, or when any kind of exploration is made, first there is years and years of testing. No question it's a miracle. There's absolutely no question about it that this is a miracle. So now does anybody know what Zamzam means? It means stop, stop. Remember that Hajra did not speak Arabic, right? They're not Arabs. So what she did is when she came out, she saw this water, right? So her in, in, immediate uh, instinct is, I don't want to waste this water. I want this water to be preserved, right? This is what she wants. And so what she did was she actually made a little, if you like, small, uh, uh, it's a barrier almost. Like you can say it's a barrier. It's not a wall. I want to show you this well because up till now to this day, we're talking about thousands of years ago. This water is used by thousands and thousands, in fact, millions of pilgrims every year, hujjaj, right? Not just hujjaj, even people who go for umrah, even people. So all kinds of usage for this water. And the well shows, mashallah, no signs of drying up. It's an amazing miracle. It's an amazing miracle. The water is sweet. Those of you who've been there, if your parents have been there, if your family's been here, friends have been there, you can store this water for years in your home. It will not go bad. Now, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. So it's not just the, the fact that the water is coming out for thousands of years without any signs of drying up. They've tried to figure out where it's coming from. They can't figure out. It was tried already. They tried to figure out its constituency. What's it made of? How come it lasts this long? Amazing again. It's amazing again. They cannot understand how water from a desert is so perfectly suited to human needs. It's perfect when it comes to its electrolytes, you know, the salts that's in there, the, uh, if you like, other things that are in there. It's just perfect. It's got no preservative, nothing. Nothing is there. So we have Zamzam. Now we also have, and this is what I want to tell you all, inshallah, because we're in the last few minutes of our pran, that this actual action, this actual activity that took place in the middle in the middle, in the middle of the desert, is the place where now Kaaba is. And that's another, I mean, we're going to talk about it next week, inshallah. But I wanted you all to know that this is how the fifth pillar of Islam has come around. By the activity of a mother who was running between two pillars, two uh, rather hills, to uh, look for water. That's how much Allah values a mother's uh, desire to help her child, to help her child, right? To help her child. Not only that, but I think there are two very important points, very important points. And one of them is, do you, do you, under the circumstances that you have, do you do what Allah asks you to do? Like, for example, it's really cold, right? It's early in the morning. You'd much rather be in your bed. But those of you who are 10 and older, do you get up and do your Fajr Salah? Do you get up and do your Fajr prayers, right? Because that's what Allah has asked you to do. You can't say, oh Allah, it's so tiring. It's so cold. It's so, you know, it's so early. Can I not do a bit later? See, when you start reasoning with Allah, what you're really saying is somehow Allah does not know what he's asked you to do. So guys, all of you, all of you, myself included, we should understand this extremely important point. 
when you do what Allah asks you to do without questions, I'm not saying you won't have some questions. What I'm trying to distinguish between is questioning Allah versus asking about it. Asking about it is okay. This is how we understand things. If we understand who Allah is, if we understand who, what he has done for us, what he has created, what his expectations are of us, and what he is expecting us to do, right? It's a two-way relationship. It's not a one-way relationship. We can't just expect it, take, take, take. No relationship works like that. So when you do what Allah has asked you to do, and when you are younger, of course, you have more questions. But I'm, ask, I'm saying, really, do you see how un- questioned loyalty to Allah's commands did what they did to Hajra. I mean, Hajra alayhi salam's name, Ibrahim alayhi salam's name, Ismail alayhi salam's name are etched in our shaykis. We can't think about anything that is, a, if you like, a father figure or a mother figure or a child that's a role model for us, except that we have to mention these great guys. Why? What did they do? Well, they did what Allah asked them without questions. That's what they did. And as the story unfolds next week, inshallah, you'll see more of the same. The second point I want all of us to do is to remember to trust Allah, right? You have to trust him. If you don't trust him, it means you somehow think he's got things not on your side. He's sometimes working against you. But Allah is always doing things to help us. There is absolutely no question about it. Talk about it. If you're having a tough time, ask Allah. If you are having a tough day, ask Allah. If you are having a tough time, and if even if you have a good day, still ask Allah. You know what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, even if your shoelace broke, ask Allah for it. Because the idea is not so much asking Allah because you need something from Allah. It's because you trust Allah so much. Yes, of course, you're going to go and get that from the store. Yes, of course, you're going to get happy. Your mom and dad do it. But do you trust Allah? Do you actually put your trust in Allah? After all, who gave you parents? Who gave you the home you live in? Who gave you the food that you're eating? Food does not come out of the ground for no reason. Food is not the way we started. We started with a seed. We started a seed. We put water in it. We put topsoil on it. We prevent it from the weeds. We make sure it's protected from this, that, and the other. But really... Do we actually believe that without the help of Allah, any of this can take place? Do we really think so? So asking Allah in all situations, all situations, I want you all to remember whatever situation you have, ask Allah. Notice Ibrahim alayhi salam never gave up his trust in Allah. How many situations have we seen? He was thrown in the fire. Remember right at the beginning, he was actually thrown in the fire. He told the angel, I only expect from Allah. He didn't even want the angel to do anything for him. Secondly, when he was having a conversation with the king, he never said anything except he put Allah in the situation. What did he say? He said, my, my, uh, Allah, my God, makes the sun come out from the east. Can you bring it out from the west, right? Understand that do what Allah asks you to do. Do it without questions. Recognize that Allah means well for you. Appreciate that Allah has done so many things for you, even without you asking. He created you. He gave you hands. He gave you your eyes. He gave you your ability to speak. He gave you your, your beautiful mother and father. He gave you the food that you ate. He gave you the water that me and you drink. He has done so much for you and me. He has given this beautiful sun that shines. If the sun wasn't there, we would have frozen. He has given a beautiful winter. He's given us the birds to look at. He's given us pets. He's given us so many things. Why do we think that Allah would now do something that we should question? We should do what Allah has asked us. If you know, and your mom and dad will, of course, be very powerful sources for you, asking them, has Allah asked us to do uh, prayers? Has he asked us to do the salah? Short answer is yes, he has. Now trust Allah. Trust Allah. And if you find yourself facing a situation, ask Allah. Ask him. Ya Allah, I'm having difficulty getting up. Ya Allah, I'm having difficulty with, uh, with concentrating in my, in my work. Ya Allah, I have problems with anger. Ya Allah, I have problems getting up in the... Whatever it is, put your trust in Allah and ask Allah. And you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed, guys, 
how much you will trust Allah, how your trust in Allah will actually give you a more confident life and you will have a more confident way of dealing with things. I'm not saying everything is going to become suddenly OK. I'm just saying you will have much better ability to cope with the situation as they are. I really thank all of you. Uh, we're going to come back. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.